We're going to turn to our Bibles now. I'll need to go and grab mine. <clears throat> and this is uh, the next in our series in, in Mark. And we're thinking about signs and ends this morning. Uh, Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through to 27. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress, unequalled from the beginning, when God created the world until now, and never to be equalled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. On the 3rd of February, 1931, it began as a quiet Tuesday morning in the beautiful coastal region of Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. The residents of Napier and Hastings, the two main towns in that area, went about their business as they had done for decades. Customers were keeping their banks busy, shops were filled with merchandise and eager buyers, Restaurants were clearing away the breakfast dishes and preparing for the lunch crowd. Those on holiday made plans to go to the beach. In other words, life was going on as it always had been and probably always would as the sun rose over these idyllic villages. And then at 10.46, 
in the morning, everything changed. An earthquake struck. In less than three minutes, seismic forces reaching 7.9 on the Richter scale destroyed most of the buildings in both towns, killing hundreds of people. And those structures that weren't flattened by the quake were destroyed in the subsequent fire that swept through um, the ruins. And once the smoke and dust had cleared, the residents of Napier and Hastings were, one, were met with a great surprise. The shattered landscape bore little resemblance to the terrain they had known so well. Landmarks such as Napier Bluff Hill, a popular tourist attraction, had been torn from the coast and tossed into the sea. What had once been flat ground was now a series of hills where there had been valleys, there was now level ground. Most shocking of all was that the water that had been in Haruri Lagoon had somehow been swallowed up, leaving 9,000 acres of dry ground. And when the residents of Hawke's Bay set about rebuilding their town, they faced a dilemma. The extent to which the earthquake had changed their environment was astonishing. Um, their maps of the region no longer applied. Those maps showed roads running along land that no longer existed, and they did not know, did not show the new land that was heaved up by the earthquake. Everything had changed for these people during that event. Life would never, ever be the same again. Things did change. There's a picture of what it looks like now and they rebuilt the city, but everything changed. Uh, when we look at Mark chapter 13, Jesus is describing some catastrophic events that would change the course not only of people's lives, and particularly of the lives of his followers, but also of history. Uh, nothing would ever be the same again. This is a challenging passage for a number of reasons, and I'll just outline those briefly here. First of all, it deals with difficult things, doesn't it? It deals with cataclysmic events. It's in the language that Jesus uses. Not one stone will be left on another, one phrase. Wars and rumours of wars, earthquakes, famines, birth pains. Then we have that very mysterious phrase, the abomination that causes desolation. What on earth is Jesus talking about there? And then there's some prophetic language. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. So it deals with difficult things. It's a challenging passage. It's a challenging passage because those of you who have perhaps studied the end times, and perhaps this teaching of Jesus will know that it's a subject of much debate. What on earth is Jesus referring to here? Um, if you read commentaries on this, there will be some who say that this wholly relates to the fall of Jerusalem and the events in AD 70. There are others who say that this wholly relates to Jesus' second advent, his second coming, his coming again. There are those who will split the passage up and say that this relates partly to the fall of Jerusalem. Jesus was talking about that. The remainder to Jesus' second coming, and they will split it at verse 19. There are others who focus mainly on the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and then just those verses 24 to 27 as referring to future things that would happen beyond that event and the coming again of Jesus. So what are we talking about here? What is Jesus talking about? And it's also a challenging passage because Jesus calls his disciples to live and act distinctively for him in the midst of all of this going on, all of these catastrophic events going on. We've got to keep a clear head in the midst of it. So it's a challenge, isn't it, for those who are going to follow him. 
I'm going to pick one of those four that were on that earlier um, slide and say that I think the majority of what's being talked about here is that time that Jesus was looking forward to in AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. But I do think that within that, Jesus is pointing forward to other events that would happen beyond that, most notably the fact when he comes again. And we'll focus a little bit on that when we look at verses 24 to 27. So let's spend a short time examining Jesus' teaching on this passage, and in particular the three important responses that Jesus is asking um, of his disciples, and we'll apply them to ourselves um, at the end. So first of all, let's set the scene. Jesus and his disciples are looking, overlooking this magnificent temple, one of the most beautiful buildings and most magnificent structures in the world at that time. Herod's temple at Jesus' time was still incomplete. It took over 30 years to build and it was the thing that the Jewish people admired hugely as they looked at it. And Jesus' disciples were not the only ones, were they? They, they looked at those buildings and thought, what magnificent buildings. This is a sign that God is with us, that God is in the midst of us. And as they were looking at these buildings, Jesus delivers these rather shocking words. It's surprising and shocking to them. All you see here, Jesus is saying to his disciples, will one day be destroyed. Just as the earthquake in Hawke's Bay shook the residents in that part of the world in 1931, quite literally, so the events of the destruction of the temple would rock their world and life would never ever be the same again for you. And in this context, as we, we look at this passage, I think Jesus says three things to them. The first is, don't panic. As you would expect with this shocking statement, the disciples naturally wanted to ask Jesus about it. Two sets of brothers turn on Jesus and say to him, when are these things going to happen? What are the signs that these things are going to happen. For them, the thought of the temple being destroyed meant that their world was going to come to an end. And a similar thing had happened when Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians many years earlier. The Jewish people had thought the end of their world had come. And in response to Jesus's, Jesus answers their question, and uh, these verses, up to verse 13, prepare the disciples for that period up to the time when the temple, that beautiful building, would be no longer. He says that during this time, there will be deception. There will be rumours. There will be fake news. And aren't we familiar with that today? Watch out. No one deceives you. Many will come claiming I am he. So during this period of time, up to the destruction of the temple, Jesus is saying, many people will claim to be who I am. God's Christ sent. And when you hear of wars and rumours of wars, don't be alarmed. Such things will happen. There will be deception um, during this time. And not only that, the world will be up in upheaval. The nations around, you will hear of these wars and rumours of wars. There will be devastation in various parts of the world, earthquakes and famines. These, says Jesus, are the beginnings of the birth pains. And not only that, he says to his followers, you need to be prepared for persecution. He warns them that they will get caught up in all of this uncertainty, in all of this fake news, in the various conflicts that are going around. You, if you stand up for me, will be arrested, you'll be flogged, you'll be put on trial, you'll be betrayed, you will be hated. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, don't panic. Don't be alarmed. 
Be on your guard. Stand firm. A few years ago, I took my two nephews down to Battle Abbey, and they had one of these reenactments of the Battle of Hastings. Very exciting it was. And uh, King Harold and his troops were up the top of a hill. You can just about see them in the distance there. And they were all standing on the top of the hill. And the Norman troops were going up the hill. And initially they were repelled. And uh, they had to retreat. And then after discussion, they formed a plan that as they went up that hill, they would then all start running away in order to break the ranks of the Saxon army. And that is exactly what happened. That really is how the Battle of Hastings was lost. Harold was saying to his troops, stand firm, stand with me. And some of the less disciplined ones, as the Normans retreated, broke ranks and ran down the hill, only for the Normans to turn round and indeed their cavalry to come up and sweep through and so win the battle. And they lost the battle because they didn't stand firm. Jesus asks his followers to stand firm, not to panic in the midst of it all. All these things must take place before the catastrophe I've told you about will happen. The second thing, and we'll look at this in verses 14 to 23, is that Jesus tells his disciples that when these things, this destruction of the temple in AD 70 happens, you are to think clearly and act wisely. And Jesus talks about this event um, as being marked by a distinctive sign. The mood changes from preparation to the actual thing happening now. And we got this phrase, the abomination that causes desolation. There's a sign here, Jesus is saying. You'll know when these things happen because this will take place at the very place where the worship of God takes place. And Mark is keen to point this out. He says, let the reader understand. So take note of this. This is really important, what Jesus is saying here. What is this abomination? Um, there are clear parallels with the prophet Daniel. In fact, quite a lot of Jesus' teaching here you will find echoed um, in the prophecy of Daniel. And Daniel is warning of an appalling object or person whose presence signifies destruction. In Daniel's case, it referred to invading pagan armies coming into Jerusalem and stopping temple worship setting up an image or an idol in the very place where the one true God was worshipped. And that was certainly true of the events in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple burnt and it was desecrated. Not only would there be a distinctive sign, but it would be a desperate time. When that happened, Jesus' instruction to his followers was not that they stand firm, but that they run without looking back and that they flee. And certainly the historical accounts from that time reflect just how bad those times were. Josephus, the Jewish historian, talks about the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70 and records that people were starving, that they did dreadful things, even eating their own babies. They fought for scraps of food. More Jews were killed by Jews than by the invading Romans. They turned on each other. Dark and desperate times. And it was also a time, while all this was happening, where false messiahs came even more to prominence, promising a way of escape and promising a way out. Not only that, Rome was in turmoil at that time too. At its climax in AD 69, the year before these events, four Roman emperors came and went, Nero, Otho, Vitalius and Vespasian. Each one of them, um, each one of those 
men were surrounded by violence and murder. Vespasian made his way to Rome to receive his crown, while his adopted son Titus entered Jerusalem, burnt the temple and destroyed the city. How would you describe such a year? Surely you would describe it in prophetic language, just as Jesus does here, such as dark sun, quench moon, falling stars. This was the sign that the world as they knew it was ended. It wasn't a prediction of the end of the world, but certainly a prediction of the end of the world as they knew it, the close of a way of life that had failed. And in the midst of this, Jesus says that we need to think clearly and act wisely. Eusebius, the first great Christian historian, tells his readers that when the Christians in Jerusalem saw the Roman legions approaching, that they remembered this prophecy and left the city for Pella and went among the mountains of Perea, east of Jordan. They took heed of Jesus' words. But the final thing that Jesus tells us about is that we are to be on our guard. And particularly we focus on that in verses 24 to 27. These verses look ahead to the world changing, history making events, the return of Jesus himself in glory. And Jesus confirms that these events that he's just described are not just the end, but that there is a continuous flow afterwards. The events of AD 70 will be typical of what human history is like. There will be these things, these desperate events happening throughout history. And so we read in verses 24 to 27 that the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. They're descriptive words of the coming again, perhaps, of Jesus himself. Geoffrey Grogan says, if the second advent is the greatest event to take place in the future, it would not be surprising if it had far-reaching effects at every level of being in the universe, the physical as well as the spiritual. If we were to have read to the end of the chapter, we would have read about Jesus' expectation on his disciples as we look forward to these events. He encourages us to be on our guard and to keep watch. So as the disciples looked ahead for Jesus' return, Jesus' charge was not that they sit down and write a prophetic timetable, almost always a more exciting thing to do, but rather that they kept watch. I want briefly just to think about ourselves because as we think about all that it's hard to get our heads around all that was happening but I think those three things that Jesus told his disciples then are as relevant now as they were then that we don't panic that we think clearly and that we keep watch. We were sitting um, in our prayer time at open house and uh, on a Wednesday morning. And a number of us share a little thought beforehand. And one of our number shared a thought from Isaiah chapter 30, 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. As we look at world-changing events, and I think we're in the midst of those now, aren't we? What is our reaction? Jesus says to us, don't panic. Those words about the eagle, and this, this friend shared that an eagle doesn't flap. An eagle waits for the thermals in order to soar. I think that's what God is telling us to do in the midst of the situation that we find ourselves. He's saying, don't panic. Don't flap wait for thermals of spirit and rise above these things because I am the one who is in control. 
I put that picture there of Jesus in the boat on the lake. And you know that that storm arose. And what were his disciples doing? They were flapping, weren't they? But Jesus was at peace, trusting in God. Trusting in God. And God encourages us not to panic, but to trust in him and to put our hope in him. Don't panic. Trust in God. Stand firm on those things that are important and core to our faith. Stand firm on the truth of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Stand firm on the truth of a God who loves us deeply. Stand firm on the truth of a God who loves so much that he sent Jesus to save us. Stand firm on the truth and the power and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Stand firm on his truth and his good purposes for his church, though weak and flawed. Stand firm on the authority and sufficiency of scripture. Stand firm on the truth that one day Jesus will come back and bring in the new heaven and the new earth. It all sounds rather simplistic, but Jesus is asking us not to panic, but to trust God. The second thing is that we are to think clearly and act wisely. There's a time for standing firm and there's a time for fleeing. What we need are people who trust in a God who in the midst of the chaos that's going on around us show restraint and respond with clear heads to all that is going on around us. I'll put a picture of paramedics up there because in the midst of a crisis they're the sort of people that you want around, aren't they? You don't want people who are going to be flapping around. You want people who've got clear heads and clear thinking in all of this. And this is what God is calling for us to do. We need to keep level-headed. We need to acknowledge the importance that as Christians, God has called us to live distinctively for him. We need to acknowledge the importance of praising the good but distancing ourselves from the profane. We need to acknowledge the importance of guiding each other as fellow disciples through all of the things that are going on around us and living distinctive lives for Jesus. Thinking personally, I think more than ever we need to pray together, to seek the mind of Christ with all that is going on around us as we anticipate the day when Jesus will come. And the final thing is that we need to keep watch and stay alert and notice the signs of the times around us. When I was uh, in the sixth form at Huntley School, we had the use of Mr Patrick's geography classroom during the lunchtime. The room was on the first floor and after eating our lunch, we would be t it would be turned into a battleground. Teams of boys would be at either end of the classroom and we would crouch down behind the desks and start a game of lunch top frisbee. Um, I remember um, quite a collection of ice cream tub tops being stowed away under the cupboard and being brought out. And the team that had the last man standing without getting hit by one of these was the winner. It was great fun, uh, but it was forbidden. Um, <laughs> on one occasion, I had the responsibility um, of standing guard at the top of the stairs. Occasionally, I would go down a few steps and gaze along the corridor to make sure Mr Patrick wasn't arriving. On this particular occasion, I must have been daydreaming because although I checked once or twice to see if anyone was coming, as I looked down the stairs, suddenly, to my horror, Mr Patrick was coming up. What should I do? Should I go to the door and issue a word of warning, knowing that he would hear him if I did? Should I continue on down the stairs as if nothing had happened? I'm ashamed to say... <laughs> that I chose the latter and carried on while he went up to the room. I heard the shouting that followed 
and ran. <laughs> I remember the accusations afterwards. You can imagine my name was Mud um, with my fellow colleagues. I'd let them all down. I'd failed on my watch. We are called to be people who watch, who stay alert during the rapidly changing events that are happening all around us. We are God's witnesses. We are God's early warning system to a world that needs Jesus. I put a lighthouse up there. You may think that's a welcoming light. And in some ways it does give us comfort. But the main purpose of a lighthouse is to warn about the dangers. And that is what God is calling us to do as his people, to keep watch and to stand firmly for him. Let's just pray, shall we, before we sing some songs of worship. Father, we've looked at a difficult passage this morning, and whatever our views of interpretation on it, it is clear that you're calling us not to panic, but to stand firm you're calling us to think clearly during this time and you're calling us to keep watch. Help us to follow those things that you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.